What is going on, Flood Nation? Elio Trades here, and we are about to launch into an interview that I conducted with an incredibly accomplished and talented commodities expert over at Bloomberg. Uh, there are some things that he was and wasn't able to share with us. His name is Mike McGlone, and he's actually the analyst that called for a $1,500 Bitcoin not too long ago. I covered it, and he actually reached out, and we organized this interview. I was really excited to hear what you know quantitative approaches he's been using to come up with these analyses and these predictions. And there were actually some really interesting ones that I think paint a pretty stark image of where we are, where we could be going. And of course, you know, we talk about all the different potential outcomes for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in the short, medium and long term. We were using a proprietary uh, video chat interface and I didn't want my uh, little camera to be blocking Mike's face. So I actually am very, very small in the corner, uh, but that's why I'm very small. But I hope you guys really enjoy this. I found it extremely, extremely informative and I was really excited. I just want to say a big thank you to Mike McGlone for being on on the show from both me and the pineapple. We hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you for coming on and taking the time to be here and, and chat with the FUD TV audience. And uh, thanks again for reaching out. Um, how's everything going with you? I'm assuming you're in New York there at Bloomberg. I am. You can see I'm on the desk of Bloomberg Intelligence, and I appreciate uh, you reaching out. I guess we've reached out to each other because I've been a big fan for a while. Um, and one thing I really appreciate, some of the stuff you say and the advice I think you give, I guess it's not really advice, but the main things you mentioned, I think are very helpful in this space. I found your stuff very helpful. Like the things you point out about, okay, the market's probably going lower. A lot of people aren't saying that. No, oh, by the day, by the day. And the, the, uh, the, the key factor about, that you say about psychology, and it's so important for people to recognize psychology. It's completely shifted. And it's just a question, when's that bottom? And it usually doesn't bottom on a dime. It usually takes a little while to return. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, and I'm sure we're going to launch into all that. But before we get there, I just wanted to take a second to lay a little foundation and introduce you properly. So uh, when did you start getting into, I guess, analyzing markets? Uh, how far back does this go? I, I, it seems like you're a very <laughs> senior analyst there at Bloomberg. So if you could just lay a little foundation for the FUD TV audience as to how you got into the business or the commodities analysis industry and how long you've been doing it tell by the hair, I suppose. Well, it's a long story short, it started with a snowmobile accident, but that's a, that's a long story, a short story. I started in the Board of Trade in the 80s, 1988 in the trading pits and um, came, came to New York in 93. So I've been off the pits since then, since then you know, kind of just covering markets and been mostly a market strategist, analyst, trader since then. And it's one thing I am is kind of a, a former trader. They say there's no... Uh, no uh, zealot like a convert, so I like to say it and not do it. So, for instance, for instance, in everything I analyze, we do have um, compliance restrictions in us trading things, which makes sense. Now we can get involved. I've gone the long, the, uh, the long route, and I basically don't get involved in anything I trade in. So I I, I analyze. So I broad commodities and crypto, so crude oil to gold to soybeans to Bitcoin and Ethereum is what I really cover here. And my main main purpose is as a strategist, the main thing, main goal is to get the market right. So some people, sometimes people claim, oh, you've got a vested interest. And I like to say, as far as anybody you're ever going to speak to in this space, we're about as neutral as they come, certainly in my space, because our primary goal is just getting it right. If I continue to get it wrong and people have no interest, then I'm not going to last very long. Well, I appreciate that. And obviously, um, you know, we value uh, significantly uh, neutrality and, and removing, I guess, financial incentive from your analysis and the things you talk about. That's something that we pride ourselves here uh, on at FUD TV. So we appreciate that you're doing the same. So I assuming that means that you're not invested in the market. Yeah, you, yeah, well, we're getting there. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not. So I have a few wallets. I've opened them up, and I need to. I do know. I need to get in the market more, so I understand um, more the inner workings of it. But my main goal is as a currency. Mm -hmm. the term cryptocurrency. If you know, I read Satoshi Nakamoto's white, white papers. I read the other white papers. I read the use case. I'm like, all right, this is what I want to do. I want to use it as a currency, not speculation. I think we're getting there. So I have done that. Open a few walls. I need to make them more um, useful, but I just haven't. I, every time they ask for more personal information, I get kind of scared. But <laughs> we're getting there. So I guess I want to rewind just a little bit. So how did you get into? What would you say is your foundation for analyzing currencies? Uh, what was the first kind of uh, 
market or markets that you started analyzing and how did this lead you? And, you know, what would you say besides Bitcoin and crypto are the things that you focus on most? Uh, precious metals was my foundation. So the, the comparison between Bitcoin and gold is the key thing. I was the head of research at an ETF firm that was primary um, offered precious metals ETFs. And so I've started really getting involved in looking at Bitcoin 2012 as compared to gold. Um, and that's really been my foundation. That's where I've really roped it in because to me, that was the key resistance around Mt. Gox in 2013 was the near the per ounce price of gold. And again, that was, again, the key resistance back in early 2017, end of 2016, until the market finally bo broke above. So my background is from precious metals to Bitcoin and here, commodities and, um, and cryptocurrencies. Okay, well, that's very exciting. And as we get deeper into this interview, I definitely want to uh, explore what you think the relationships between the future of Bitcoin and the future of gold might be. Um, but let's just start, I guess, with uh, when did you first hear about Bitcoin? Uh, when 2012. Did you, 2012. Yeah. And yeah, when did, you. Yeah, 2012. And when interrupt you in 2012 and really um, 2013. And then really, um, I've never, never invested. I just don't do much investing anymore except my um, in, you know, standard 401k kind of stuff. Plus I have four kids in college. So, <laughs> did. so that's the primary cash flow is negative. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so the main, main, I guess, main start was precious metals and it's 2012, 13, but I really got involved in 2016 reading a lot of books. Um, and that's one thing about this space. So I find your, um, your videos very important part of that education there's so much out there there's so much you can learn if you're willing to put the time and place into it and i view you as a primary i mean i listen and read as much as i possibly can books um, one key book was bitcoin standard another one was um, digital gold and there's just so many of them those are a few that i can remember and that's what i encourage all people to get into this space just read and study as much as you can because i find the space fascinating i'm just trying to put value on it yeah, I think that's a very, very fair way to approach it and obviously a very difficult task given, um, you know, uh, that it's kind of being priced as of what it will be, not what it is. And so I, I guess as we get in here, I want to know, how do you approach even putting a value on Bitcoin? And how would you, uh, you know, I know that uh, for our viewers who are not familiar, you made a call that Bitcoin would drop to $1,500. And you've been making that call now for some time. So maybe you can let us know, uh, how did you come to make that call? And when did you start making that call? And what were, of course, the tools that you used to make that call? It was about a year ago. Um, and so it, nothing like the blessing and the curse. If we picked the peak within a week. And there was three key reasons we did that was the, the three Fs, the frenzy, the launch of futures, and Fed tightening. So one thing we do is I use everything I can, every data point I can to find what this space is either highly negatively correlated or positively correlated to. The key thing that Bitcoin has been negatively correlated to is Fed tightening. So one thing we had December a year ago is we had a futures launch, both futures, CME and CBOE, mm -hmm. and the Fed tightening all within a week, maybe two weeks. And that, to me, was a key signal. I mean, if there's ever been a bell ringing at the top, now, everybody knew it was a frenzy. I mean, you, you were saying it. Everybody was, we all knew it was obnoxious. But it's just trying to pick the peak, and we, we were able to do that. So now it's a bit of a curse. Where is it going to go? Um, and for a while, we've been, you know, way back in February, we pointed out typically when you have a market like this, that you, if, if you define what it is, I defined it as, yes, it's currencies, but it got overwhelmed by speculation. You typically go back to some form of base. And um, so that's where we're able to pick the peak. And then we've all been looking for the base. And typically, initially, I used about 900 as the base. Now, I know that's very low, but historically, if you look at things, um, in the context of Bitcoin starting on trading around one penny or less, it's really not. And if you look at all the, you know, the history of Bitcoin itself and the history of other markets, that type of, those type of retracements have been common. Um, so that's been one thing. And the bottom line we've found is really worked for Bitcoin is the continuous mean. What the continuous mean is that's the average price since day one. Now, our data only goes back to since like mid 2000 and early 2010, mm -hmm. so when it was a, a dollar. And the continuous mean in 2011 was the low, which, and in 2014, the bear market, that was the low. Right now, the continuous mean is around 1,500, thus the level 1,500. 
Okay. So I guess that's a, a fairly simplistic, uh, not, not even uh, so highly technical way to look at what the low might be by just saying, what's the average price over all time? And uh, that's probably where we would see as a low after the frenzy. That's very interesting. I guess uh, as you look at it, you said one of the key factors in picking the peak was the launch of a futures market. Can you expand a little bit on what you mean by why the launch of a futures market would lead to a peak? That's my background as futures. And um, the thing people need to remember of futures, the number one purpose of futures in history was to short the market. They started for farmers to hedge their products. So they could, every time they went to the, you know, to the heart, to the market in, let's say October with their, their, that year's harvest prices would collapse. So it started so they could start hedging. They would short futures and the market got, you know, became more involved, but that's the number one reason for futures for, um, producers to hedge their production. So what I determined was, okay, markets, futures, finally it allows a more efficient way to short. Now, we knew people could short before. It's more institutional way to short. It made it more institutional, but it was also the psychology of, wow, this market's finally becoming mainstream, and that's the key thing. Once you have a market that the select few do very well, once it becomes mainstream, the vast majority of the performance is over and should be done. Secondly, it's something like this, and this is one thing I need to warn anybody in this space is, um, life change in wealth for the masses is virtually impossible. But the select few have already done that. Now, there's going to be great trading opportunities, but the 100Xs and even the 10Xs we've had in the past are probably gone. So uh, I guess I'm going to uh, put a little pin on one of the things you said, which is that futures markets are almost exclusively used to short the market. That uh, longing the market is not the purpose of a futures market because essentially you just buy the underlying asset or invest in that underlying asset. Um, I guess it, with not with uh, vegetables as they would go bad, but with something like a precious metals. Um, so I think that's very interesting and obviously we all know that as soon as futures launched, down went the market. Um, I also will circle back in a few minutes once we talk about the potential for uh, more gains in the futures, uh, in the future, not futures. But uh, let's talk about gold for a second, because we all know that when gold first launched a futures market, the price of gold, you know, uh, essentially crumbled uh, beneath, you know, very analogously to to bitcoins. And yet, when an ETF was brought in for gold, we saw a skyrocket of the price. Do you think, uh, especially given that you've looked at Bitcoin through the lens of a precious metal or a digital precious metal like gold, do you see there being potential for something like that to happen? Uh, there's a potential, certainly. I just want to clarify real quick on futures. That was the initial purpose of futures was shorting the market, but now they're used for everything. Mm -hmm. And and buying, longing, getting long, buying, selling, whatever, everything. But so on gold, yeah, there's a the potential. The thing I need to... Um, that's a decision for SEC, but it also kind of gets away a bit of the initial purpose of currencies. And are they used for transactions? Or are we going to buy them and put them on our mattresses? Now, gold has that, you know, gold's you know, it's one of the best stores in value in the history of the world. In fact, it basically is in terms of history, and it still has it going forward. It's such a unique element and currency and commodity. Um, that's why I think cryptos need to go. Bitcoin's trying to gain that. The problem is then it's not going to be intended used for transactions. So I'm a bit concerned. But also what I see in this space, it's so unregulated, which means there's rampant manipulation, collusion, uh, spoofing. And if I see it as an ex-trader, and I don't see any anecdotal signs of it, then I'm sure the SEC is on top of it. So I know for a fact that's part of their main issues. For So I don't really... Our ETF people don't think it's going to be for a while, but I prefer not to hang my hat on that as a bullish thing. And I think if it happens, it obviously boosts the market, but I'm afraid it'll be more short term. I'm looking for more organic reason for the market to return rather than, um, okay, well, people are going to buy it and put it away. Yeah, that might be good, but institutions need regulation. They need a good, solid reason, and adult, adult supervision is definitely needed in the space. Now, futures help that. Okay, so I want to touch on a couple of things you said, which is, of course, that gold is one of the most phenomenal stores of value in history. But of course, making gold or using gold for pra pragmatic payments for paying for a cup of coffee does not make sense because of the physical nature of gold. And and obviously, you can have uh, you can have ownership certificates of gold that you can trade, um, but those have not been put into a format that's so easy to trade, like with a credit card or you know via PayPal. Uh, do you think that the implications of being able to take something that that acts like a gold um, and is traded like a token like Bitcoin, do you think that that uh, then presents 
a, a, an explanation or a segue into why this could gain more value and why uh, the need or the demand for something like that could could uh, could essentially create a uh, require a larger volume for actual currency demand or, or, you know, the actual market cap could expand because more people would have a desire for something like that. Sold. You nailed it. To me, that's exactly where it needs to go. That's gold annualized volatility is around 10%. Typical annualized currency for like the dollars around 5%. Bitcoin got up to 100%. XRP is near 100%. That's just not a currency. Um, to me, that's where it's going to go and has to go. And that to me is a trend that's happening this year. It's towards stability. And I think gold is the ideal, not particular gold, but a cryptocurrency attracts something like gold. It has a similar type of, because gold is neutral. It's no one else's liability. And that's the premise of cryptos. It can't be a U.S. dollar. I mean, Tether is great. I, I mean, I'm not saying it's great, but it's, it's, but it's U.S. dollars. So it needs to be neutral in that case. And that's why I think any type of crypto that comes, I've seen a lot of them. And we've seen new ones that is similar to gold and maybe tracks gold, but it's easily transacted. Um, to me, that's where it, that's ideal, but I'm not a technician and maybe you can help form that. <laughs> but as a, as a strategist, I think that's what, that's what the world needs. And I think that's what it would win. So in theory, uh, if, you know, obviously considering that we're always mining more gold, there's more gold coming into circulation. Uh, we don't know how much there is in theory, uh, Bitcoin being finite and being in, you know, divisible by however many, uh, you know, significantly enough that you could have such small portions of it that it, you know, even if it swelled up to be worth a million dollars per coin, for example, you could still transact at small levels with Satoshi's. Is there an argument then, based on what you've said here, if Bitcoin starts behaving a lot more like gold, and let's just imagine for a second that the transactional aspect of it was resolved and it's very easy uh, to, to, to send Bitcoin for uh, that $5 coffee or that you know $2 that you want to lend to your friend, uh, does that now create a use case uh, in your mind uh, if it starts acting like that really solid uh, use, uh, store of value that it could then become sort of, I guess it could grow in, in, in total cap market cap uh, to occupy something like a gold market cap? Uh, well, absolutely. It could go there. It should go there. And I think it already has, to some extent, replaced some of gold. Like, it's ideal for – imagine anybody in a, cur- a country with poor currency stabilization, Venezuela, Turkey this year, China. China was one key thing I want to get to a little bit is, yeah, absolutely, there's a good incentive for Bitcoin. Just push a button, diversify your holdings. People in USD don't have to worry, but it's get, it's already there to some extent. It's just way too nascent, nascent I guess. It's too volatile too speculative mm-hmm. and getting closer to that stability in gold. Yeah, that's, that's where that should be the target. So I think that's, we're getting there, but um, I'm, I'm afraid that the price of Bitcoin is going to go kind of locked down there. The price will go and stay there because that was kind of the key level before that, that's kind of a ad, added analysis. Well, well, I want to be clear about what we're talking about, the price of gold, because right now the actual total value of the gold market cap is exceeds the tens of trillions. So we're talking about a market cap for Bitcoin that is now below the $100 billion mark. So now you're talking about, to me, uh, the, the simple math there would show that if it does start to approximate the value of gold, that there is 100x there still potentially. Well, one big problem is there's only one gold and silver or something like that. How many forks do we have of Bitcoin? Um, how many alt currencies are there? And they're all supposed to be better than Bitcoin. Um, that to me is one key issue. Um, so... Um, and that to me has been my major issue from the beginning is this massive supply. And that was really the big trigger for the sickness sell off recently was the, the cat, the uh, Bitcoin cash fork, which just institutions and professionals look like this. Oh, man, it's just another massive amount of supply with some dicey characters going at it. And uh, that doesn't play well in any type of institution. But, yeah, that's the issue is there's just there's nowhere near that type of um, supply competition for gold. OK, and I will I will obviously that is clear, and I agree with that. But in theory, if there were a prevailing uh, Bitcoin chain in the next few months to years, then in theory, uh, a Bitcoin that, yeah. that approximates this value or the utility of gold with, of course, the added utility of being able to spend and transact on it in very, very finite amounts would potentially, in your mind, be able to get to a gold market cap. Oh, I don't know. No, that no, that getting to the gold market I getting to the no, so I get your question. Getting to the gold market cap, maybe. Um, but that I don't, I don't really feel it, it's possible because of the competition. Mm-hmm. Um, that is just so much competition and the, the risk for hard forks. So I don't really believe that can happen. 
but of course, there's always probabilities. So I'm, I yeah. wouldn't, for me, that's not that's not really a, on my radar of a probability. Okay. So as we go forward here, what are the things that you really want the FUD TV audience to know about the current <laughs> state of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? What analyses do you think are really pressing that people should be aware of um, besides the, you know, the continuous mean? Uh, are there any charts or data that you want to show to, to sort of yeah. illustrate your points here? Let me bring you into the terminal here a little bit. I'll show, and at least maybe we can show some of this stuff. I'm going to share my screen. Awesome. Um, and let's see if we can do this. Should work fine. Shared. You see it? Uh, yes. Okay. You just popped up. Awesome. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to show you what I did. We put out. Um, Monthly, we're going to do a monthly commentary, and you, your viewers can get on, on the web, Bloom, uh, Bloomberg Crypto's Outlook, and I'm just going to show you. I'll link it. I'll link it below the video. Yeah, fine. I can show you some of the recent ones I did. I want to show you one key theme for people to look for in the market is um, I've already showed you the continuous mean. What mentioned it, but I just want to show you the chart real quick, um, and you can see how this is just a chart of Bitcoin versus its continuous mean. You see how on this, how it, in the past the low was 2011 was there. The low in 2015 was there. Now we've broken down. For it to not get there, it'd be great. But it, for, it's kind of in the no man's loan. Typically, once it gets down in this area, it goes to that mean. And and so, so that green line there is the uh, exactly represents uh, you're right on the mean. Um, you see, the there is a little dip below it there in the late yeah. 2011. But for the right. most part, in its history, it's almost never been below that. And then, of course, when we see the big run ups, we can see that those are are drastically out of proportion from the mean. 28 times the mean. So it, this kind of puts it in context of the recent peak we had was simply the similar, the same thing it did 2013. It's about 28 times the mean. Okay, oh. great. I mean, that's wonderful. Um, I, I don't think we're ever going to do that again because of what I've seen in the space, but we should recover. And it should, the question is where it recovers from. So one thing I wanted to mention is key, some of the key things I watch is this chart here. Now, this is, again, just a little bit of the price of showing how it, Bitcoin peaked at the price of gold. This is the yellow line, 2013. And then it hovered there for a while, 2017. Then it was game on. So I'm still worried about coming back to that price. We, we've already mentioned that, so we don't have to dig into that too much. But I want to show you some fundamental things. Those are more technical. NVT ratio. You've probably heard that network value to transaction ratio. Yes, correct. Yeah, I'm sure your viewers have heard a lot, and we've read a lot about, a lot about it. But... Typically feel free remark- feel free to explain and define terms because obviously not everyone does as much research as I do so yeah <laughs> well the um, it's it just basically the uh, market cap of of Bitcoin market capitalization divided by the daily transactions in dollars great so what we do we show here is just basically a 12 week average so you, you can't really show a daily because it's too um, too volatile but here's a weekly and it's already starting to peak the point is it typically bottoms from a much lower level now there's it's some needs to be mentioned that if Bitcoin is just bought and hold and not transacted like gold um, Fine, and NVT ratio can remain high, but just using past performance, typically the price of Bitcoin hasn't bottomed until the NVT ratio reached much lower levels, right around 50. It's currently around 300. So that's a bit of a warning sign. But I did want to show you, that was something that's, I want to show you a few things that I've been worried about and I've been mentioning for months that said Bitcoin should go to three to 4,000 that have actually improved. Mm-hmm. Um, and Great. that's only been in the last few weeks. So I can go there. What you see here is that um, I've been pointing how address is used. A good supply, Bitcoin address is used, a good indication of Bitcoin demand. And this was analysis we did back for the November outlook, but the chart I want to show you has really shown improvement, which I'm clicking on right now, um, because I was pointing out how address is used currently were equivalent to Bitcoin around 4,000. Now, boom, we've done that. Price has gone to 4,000, so it's already met where the price addresses used was in the past. The good news is addresses used is trending up, which is what it's done in the past. The bad news is it's correct. It's had its most significant correction in history, mm-hmm. and it's still at that below last year's low. But if I, you know, I scale this longer, you can see the we're looking for. I'm going to just make this log. We're just always looking for um, similar trends. I just made them both kind of log because they move so much. You see those addresses used in white and the price of Bitcoin, that's all we're looking for. Okay. And that's actually I, I, the market. And just looking for trends that have 
worked in the past, drove in price, driven prices higher. But this big correction, you know, looks like it's still coming back to this four thousand level. Uh, so I see that you're you're focusing quite a bit on the uh, transaction levels and the you know the the amount of wallets and and these types of things and so obviously in my mind this kind of screams out that as we potentially patch up the transactional aspects of Bitcoin's network uh, potentially with a Lightning uh, Layer Two solution or a backed network that creates a Layer Two solution that makes it very easy for people to have and, and transact upon the network um, would actually work even if the price doesn't go up to actually balance out some of these factors and have more transactions flowing through the network uh, compared to its price or market capitalization. And I guess the second thing I wanted to bring up was, you know, there's a noteworthy figure in our space called uh, Anthony Pompliano, um, who I don't know if you've uh, heard of, but he's, you know, uh, sort of pr uh, more prominent on Twitter. And he was on CNN the other day essentially saying that the relationship between transactional uh, volume and actual total valuation, uh, if you're going to use uh, market cap as a way to sort of approximate total valuation uh, is actually about the same as MasterCards. Um, if you look at their $180 billion uh, valuation and at their transactional uh, volume uh, as far as daily volume. Exactly. I, I think we're going there. I think you're spot on. We need to get there. And the best way to get there is reducing the speculative excesses. You can't, it's very rare for a currency to have that kind of volatility and be used as a currency. Then it's just used for speculation and trading. But I want to get you to, to, to a few things that also are showing an improvement, but I'll start with first the massive, one thing as a strategy issue, key thing you're looking at is supply, demand, and price. So the one big simplistic way to look at Bitcoin is the supply of not so much Bitcoin of cryptocurrencies. This is the overall supply. Coinmarketcap.com supplies over 2,000. The key significance is this is somewhat psychological because we all know only really the top 30 have really any value and they only have any use, really good use case that people can use. The significance is the last time we had a bear market, this measure of supply, as I show in the lower case in this blue line, flat line, it actually started to decline. Now we might be peaking, but that's what I think we've reached is an inflection point where prices need to go down until price and supply adjusts accordingly. It's just classic supply and demand. There's just way too much price make too much supply to support prices. And I think that's what's happening. So we need some purging, probably. It looks like it's just starting. And unfortunately, it might be early days. So that's one big picture thing I'm looking for is 2,000 cryptocurrencies is just a lot. Um, in kind of way, you know, we all heard about internet companies back in 2000. But one thing I also wanted to show you is because you mentioned transactions is this is a chart of um, mentions um, Medcalf's law, which basically points out the market's only worth the value of it's used for transactions. But I want to show you on this chart how it's improved. See that move up? It was very bearish, but that move up just I the last that. three months. So it's getting better. In the past, anytime we've been above this market line, it's been somewhat bullish for prices. It's just the first sign of improvement this year has been this flush in prices. So we're would you, there, would you say that the last couple of months, this last little spike there is is breaking somewhat the trend that it was on? Uh, well, hopefully. You can see the trend still down, and it only mattered once it broke through the line when the market was a little aggressive, way too, this was like November last, a year ago. Gotcha. Which is way too overdone. But it looks like it's breaking the trend, which is what I'm looking for. You know, I can just draw a trend line on it and, and see... Um, like is that working? Out? But you can just kind of picture it potentially breaking above here. Yep. So those are the kind of things we're looking for. I'm looking for essentially. I love, you know, I'm always looking for people like you, anyway, to give me ideas of things we can look at that give us indications for the market to show value and bottom and things like that. So I would totally agree with you uh, on a few things you said. I think it's a little bit too difficult to take every cryptocurrency and put them into an analysis because obviously, just like websites, some were Amazon and some were Pets.com. And, and that's the sort of reality about uh, the entrepreneurial world is that not all of these experiments will work. Um, but, you know, knowing that the core experiments that are, that are really driving the market, you know, m most importantly, Bitcoin and then quite a few others that are uh, important as well. Uh, those are the ones I guess I wanted to focus on because I think if those prove out, then it doesn't matter if there's 10,000 or 10 million failed ones, as long as we get uh, a, a true genuine use case and utility out of out of uh, the real you know core focus here, which is the Bitcoins and you know transactional. There's going to be a lot of different ways to use cryptocurrency in my 
personal opinion, but obviously I'm, I tend to focus more on Bitcoin because it's been proven uh, at, definitely throughout this year that Bitcoin is going to drive the markets in whichever direction it goes. So, um, and obviously it's because most people, uh, most of the liquidity in the market came from Bitcoin, started in Bitcoin, a lot of the big holders there. But I think this has been really, really uh, informative. Uh, is there anything you want to start going into, start talking about that you think we haven't covered, uh, talking about potential uh, upside or downside that we could be looking forward to? Uh, well, I'm, the key things I'm watching is, like I mentioned, NBT ratio, I'm watching um, psychology to see that shift. And I think that one thing that we need is what's happened in the past. You kind of need a lack of faith. Now, we're clearly there. Started. It's a question of how long it's going to last. I'm afraid typically these things take a little bit longer um, and much more um, – extreme I and mean, we know it's pretty extreme now but it just takes a lot more time mm -hmm. so i'm looking for like things i've just showed i'm um, have on the screen now if you want i'm just looking for a pickup in in volume but not because the market's going down because the market's going up um and right now we're not there so i'm open to any indications oh a key thing also is shorts that's what really triggered us to get really bearish early in the month is bitcoin shorts the measure we try to use as much as we can drop to the lowest level of almost of the year since like March. And that was a bad sign because you want shorts to be really high. I mean, you want the market to get really short and then it usually will go up. And we're starting to inch up a little bit. I think we need a new high in shorts. And one other key thing is a new low in volatility. Typically those have marked bottoms. And that's the key things I'm watching, like in this chart here. Um, and the low in short or the high in shorts is a cycle, is essentially a psychological evaluation, right? Exactly. But it's, it's also, it's both um, because it's an actual measure of positions. Um, and when the market is really short, you know, it means there's a foundation of shorts that need to cover below the market. When they're getting short, it pushes it lower. So that's really what's happened in the past. But also one thing I'm watching for is volatility to continue to decline. And I think volatility in Bitcoin needs to mean, re reach a new low. So like I have on a chart showing here, 180 day volatility, the, the lowest level ever reached in 180 day volatility in Bitcoin was October 2015, which was the bottom that year, the biggest month that year, which to me set the stage for this rally. And we're still above that level, but I think we need to reach new lows in volatility, and that would probably be in indicative of a market showing bottom. So I'm looking, and again, it's, we're not looking for all indications we can. That's a bit of a technical indicator. Shorts a little bit more of a, what market participants are doing. Yeah, I think that's very interesting in looking for uh, essentially when the volatility drops, which of course it has been as it flatlined at, at six yeah. six thousand between six and seven thousand. Certainly uh, not flatlining anymore. Um, but yeah, it would be very interesting to see obviously how these indicators, which you're showing, obviously corresponded almost exactly with uh, lows in the previous bear markets. And I think that's people uh, under underestimate the value of history in uh, in both you know uh, cryptocurrencies as well as traditional markets. But um, but it's very interesting to see that that low, if it gets put in in the next couple of months, if that would actually put in a new low as far as Bitcoin price uh, in this in this bear trend. I don't think many people in the space are looking for an immediate pop or an immediate change in, uh, in Bitcoin's trajectory. Um, but you did say that you don't think the ETF is going to be in the near future. I know that a lot of people are hoping that the yeah. ETF decision might come in in February as that's sort of the end of the delay period for the VanEck and SolidX uh, ETF proposal. Uh, is there any more substantive reasons why you think it might be delayed further or is it uh, just a hunch? Um, we have um, ETF strategists here who've put it off um, and they initially a year, well, actually six months ago, this is not going to be two, two, 2019. So I depend on them. And I will get back to you as far as their projected date. We might get an ETF. But so you said it's not going to be in 2019 is what you said. Oh, and initially they said it's not going to be until 2019, but this was six, eight months ago. Now, of gotcha. course, we're getting close to 2019, but I will check on their latest analysis and get back to you. What I hear is it seems to be off the radar for now for anything immediately, immediately potential. So I'm going to put my tinfoil hat on here and just see uh, how far you can come along with this theory. Is there any water in the bucket in your mind uh, with the theory that institutions are excited and recognize the value of Bitcoin and that have been, you know, they've been intentionally trying to bring the train back so that they could uh, load up? Uh, no, um, that is the things that you hear people say like that is very rare. For instance, when I hear heard um, a lot of people saying, oh, the 
exchanges were buying Bitcoin to support backed and stuff. And I used to work in an exchange that's almost unheard of um, mm. because you let it put, go to the market and you hedge. So I don't think that's likely, but I do believe um, institutions are – the herd's coming. I believe that what Michael Novogratz said. And remember, Bloomberg has been a big part of that. We launched the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index. And part of the main reason our team helped spark that was, you know, our, our BI team was um, because we wanted to help add beta to the space. And that's what institutions need. Not They're not going to just go by General Motors or, or um, Apple. They need the measure of the market. And that's what an index does. So for institutions that come in, in the real true institutions, they need a measure of beta, and that's part of the reason we launched that index. And to me, it's getting there, but it's still just got to ring out the spec limit, and it needs adult supervision. It needs regulation. Maybe the ETF's part of that, but so much there's so many things in here I'm afraid are just very illegal that mm. need to be straightened out. And there, we're, we're in the process of doing that. Uh, conflict of interest aside, what coin would you be buying if you could buy only one coin? Yeah, I knew you were going to ask me that. So I've been asked that before, and I actually was on live TV, and we started doing analysis on the best performers. So not so much what I would buy is the key point is what's been performing the best, and guess what it is? Tether. <laughs> People hate to hear that. And I remember when I was giving a presentation in Hong Kong, they said, so you like Tether? I'm like, no, I'm pointing out facts. To me, that is the, the trends that our viewers really need to be aware of. Tether's been doing well, partly because people are getting other coins, but it's also a stable coin. And to me, that's the future of a true transactional cryptocurrency. It needs to be stable. And that's why I kind of go back to where we started, gold. But why, um, would, but why would you buy Tether with dollars? I'm not saying I would buy it. That's my point. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously, I can't really answer that question because I'm not allowed to from compliance reasons. Gotcha. But, I, and, but I'm pointing out... What's watched? What's been winning? Now, you, if you had, you, you want to watch like the Amazons. Amazon went from 100 to seven, 100 dollars to seven in 1999 to 2002. Now it's it got up to 1400, but it won. It was the best, basically, internet company in in world history. I'm just pointing out which what are the winners so far? Stable coins, Tether, has been the best one. So the point is, maybe that's a trend towards the market. And that's why I come back to gold, and that's why I'm really trying to be careful about the speculative part of it. Um, I think a lot of that's going to be gone from the market. I mean, we started it with speculative frenzy, and now it's going to gravitate towards more stable coins if it's going to be focused on pure, truly transactional cryptocurrencies. And obviously, you lumped in gold there, so I'm assuming you're, you're, uh, when you're talking about stable coins, you're also sort of including asset-backed coins or coins that represent other, other sort of value. Yeah, I don't know how it can be done right, um, I've dug into some of these um, these uh, methodologies and these white papers, but however a crypto could properly track gold, to me is probably a potential winner. But I, it, it's how we, they do it. Meaning, but you still need to be able to spend it easily. It can't cost four percent like Amex does. It has to cost a fraction of one percent. So I, I totally hear you, obviously, on the Tether thing. I do want to remind everyone at FUD TV that if you do have U.S. dollars and you're buying Tether, that essentially you are, that there's not much upside there, but uh, <laughs> there's only potential <laughs> counterparty risk. But at the same time, moving in, I want to ask you, how are you investing in 2019 if you're allowed to talk about that? I, I can't. Can't yeah, talk about clients, it. I'm not, I can't give investment advice like you can either. But I'm, I focus, I point out where I think markets are going. And I, I've been pointing out for two years, almost that we just redid a deck called the Three Amigos. And that was the stock market, Bitcoin, and gold. They all traded together last year. They all went up and they all went down this year. And I think gold's going to win that race. So you're saying uh, precious metals looking to have a more positive outlook uh, right now? Or Particularly gold. with the US dollar trade weighted measure at a multi year high. Um, there's a lot of mean reversion risk. I mean, it's more likely to probably go lower than continue higher, which makes precious metals look a little more attractive. Interesting. Very nice. So do you have any closing remarks for the FUD TV audience? Uh, anything you want to say at all, crypto related, investing related or otherwise? Listen to FUD TV. I found your analysis <laughs> and your, um, your outlook very helpful. I really appreciate that coming from an expert like you. It means quite a bit. And I thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been extremely, extremely informative, and I think it's going to benefit everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Mike.
Another huge thank you to Mike. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Once again, I'm really sorry for not having a very high quality version of my face on the screen, but who needs to see that? I hope you guys benefited and enjoyed watching this regardless. Let me know any comments in the comments section below. Uh, maybe if Mike's watching or feels the so inclined, he might comment back. But thanks again to Mike, and I hope you guys enjoyed all that we covered. And as usual, I will see you guys very soon on the next episode.